Okay. Sure, got the resume. Awesome. Okay. So we should be all set and live here um, in our Zoom space and on Facebook. And I'm very excited this evening to make some introductions for our Poets in Pajamas. Uh, this is our 163rd episode of Poets in Pajamas. And on behalf of Sundress Publications, uh, I'm very excited to welcome everyone who's listening to this episode with Sarah Sarai and Nitsia Mijovic. Each poet will read for about 15 minutes, and then we will finish the reading with a QA for both of these poets. And if folks are listening in, they can use the chat um, at any time to, you know, type lines that they hear that resonate for them to encourage the poets. P please feel free to use the chat for that. You can also use it for the QA, or when we get to that time, you can unmute yourselves um, and we can just have an informal discussion. Mm -hmm. Um, if anyone needs a written copy of Sarah or Melitza's poems for accessibility purposes, you can direct an email to poetsinpajamas at gmail.com, and we'll be happy to set you up with those uh, written copies. And without further ado, I, will, I would love to introduce you to Sarah Sarai. Sarah Sarai's writing is in Boston Review, Fairy Tale Review, Mom Egg, and many others. Collections include That Strapless Bra in Heaven with Kelsey in 2019, and The Future is Happy with Blaze Box Books in 2009. Sarah also writes fiction and flash and holds an MFA in fiction from Sarah Lawrence College. Sarah lives in New York City, and works as an independent editor of Most Anything with Words. And Sarah, whenever you're ready, you can take it away. Okay, thank you, and thank you for I don't want to say inviting me, but I'm really happy to be here. Um, it's always hard to pick the right poem, and I don't know that any one poem is serves as the proper introduction or epitomizes who I am. So I just sort of went with wacky, which is one of the descriptions of me. Um, I am. I'm really deep, though, man. Okay, this is pigeons are having. Pigeons are having unprotected sex on top of my air conditioner, upsetting most of my flock who know I run a moral air conditioner at top speed. There's no talking to a pigeon, only arm flappage and a stiff wind. I live by example, which I set, not in concrete with a palm I set, nor in jello, though I swoon at shimmerings, vulnerability of women, I ask pigeons protect themselves from the consequential and inconsequential. I ask women. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, this is a Vegas vegan and I wrote it very quickly. Um, I, I love the West Coast. I, um, I have to defend it a lot. And uh, so I guess that's really all I can say. Also, I love the idea. I wish I had a different kind of brain because I really do like the idea of um, statistics and actuarial tables. And I love knowing that, you know, if you do one ex latch your window, you'll, you'll that like eliminates 5% of the probability of having someone come into your house. You know, the, they figured everything out anyway. That's me, a Vegas vegan. I never promised you a statistician, although I fantasize on becoming a poet of actuarial tables, a poet of the odds, a true Vegas vegan with an eye keen for a son, longing for love and like a Greek God who misunderstands the penalties, melting into the imperishable west of the sunken and the found. You know, another way of looking. The poem on the page remains on the page. The page with the poem is, the page with the poem it may lift itself up or snack and nap. But there it is on the page in all its theory, in all its wisdom, which is not all wisdom. Hey, a blackbird knows wisdom, just one blackbird.
No need, I'm sorry, no need to cast shade over the whole of them. So I had to scroll. Okay, so since I did interrupt, that, that originally I was thinking of Wallace Stevens wrote a poem, um, 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird. And sometimes I'm just a min, I like him, but I'm a minimalist. I just say, forget all these ways of doing something. Just a thing is, it, what is it? A thing is equal to itself. <clears throat> One of the, is either Plato or Aristotle. Okay, hummingbird feeder. What is the value of having a soul that however defines sensory intelligence, prompting us to become a flank of stars or huddle of trees? For one, the soul does not do terrible things. The self, destroy it. Step outside, top off the hummingbird feeder. Less time to be terrible, less time to judge. Them, us, yourself, for one, for honor, for a lark. How brilliant Beethoven. It's a prose poem if you're looking. If my father believed he needed to arm himself against the insanely damaged, carrying rapid fire to end everyday school kids with still squishy bodies, protect, perfecting daffy walks, or teens with their dreams of endless horizons after high school. Some of them knowing life doesn't give up on its challenge, but that youth is a superpower. Well, if my father owned a gun, he'd have fumbled opening the safe, shouted at my mom and sisters to be careful as he lifted a lockbox from the safe, trembled working the lockbox and shaken on realizing nothing left to open, but a box of bullets and opening that would call the question. He'd have howled there was no lockbox in the lockbox in the safe, not that we ever owned a safe or lockbox to lock in it. Insisted we were moving back to New York. My mother, who is Christian, would have taken gun and bullets from his twitching hand to load the pistol. She gave birth four times and also could drown mice in the toilet or a pail of water. She would not have shot anyone, would have denied the weapon existed, then read Bible and attended texts, while my father, calmed by a shot of whiskey, demanded to know if I had read Robert Louis Stevenson yet, and if me and my three sisters, each far older than I will ever be, had a clue how brilliant Beethoven was. Okay, I wrote this backwind. So this takes place actually before, um, like let's say 1999, I don't know. Many can know something, backwind, many can know something, yet the thing is not known for years. Skillful we are at keeping it down. Nine of the 10 of us slap vodka into jelly jars, then up with club music and feet, all of ours poppity poppity on apartment flooring. Management phone calls, the end. Mickey and I, one block it to Union Square, where the night is a fragrant with burning Krishna. We sit top of the stairs to smoke. Our poppity host aced a job in film editing. The point is he aced out Mickey. He was skittish about sex, no criticism. I can be a prude or nunnish unless I'm not. Mickey was receptionist. Reading film scripts was the perk. Oh, that back of the neck shiver, disgusting. She checked over her shoulder. Just a skateboarder using his own skin as cover for a perfectly thin chest. A dusty Hare Krishna lighting up. Mickey warned, don't tell anyone. In another month, New York City would be ashy, then recover with nonstop memory. Mickey meant Mr. Fatty Fat Fat, now bicoastal in jail. Disgusting, not dramatic, not close. We're all ashamed of something and try not to comment on others. But everyone knows the professors, the executives, the politicians, someone or everyone knows long before 
anyone has the backwind to speak up. So I knew about Harvey Weinstein, you know, 15 years before he was a name. New Ohio Review, this is from there, um, was on a retreat in Vermont and I fell in love with a pig <clears throat> and some other things. They're every yellow leaf. Jacinth looks at the pig and asks what she did in another lifetime to be so beautiful Maybe not everyone would see it, but she's perfect. I am not everyone. I agree. Alice is perfect. A hippopotamus made compact. I stroke her dark hide and feed her fruit from breakfast. Cauliflower and a toasted bagel, plum jam. With the pig, Jacinth and I break bread. Jacob, who is new to this poem, buries his cigarette in a late fall lawn to take a call from Quebec. In bright sunlight, Alice considers eternally recycling life, is my guess. Jacinth has no interest in me or Jacob and praises only the pig who is complete, is her guess. The heart gets lonely some days, is Jacob's guess. Feeding Alice renders longing and irritation irrelevant without obliterating either. Aspen snapped their every yellow leaf. The trees expected we'd be gone by now. Their every yellow leaves don't guess. Oh, this is a very old poem. It's in Lavender Review. This way in that. And, and Blake did, as you know, William Blake, the poet and artist. Um, I, I just, that's a quote, the epigram from a letter that he wrote to a friend. This way, Matt, it was a fairy funeral, William Blake. On the garden bed of Blake's fairy procession, roll this way and that, these ways of midnight pleasure in enchantment and commonplace wisdom, like don't touch the fairies, they're sensitive. Act within a soul populated by sightings and wistful affection. See the film strip, is at high enough speed, life's fluidities felt. As at the funeral, Blake saw a body lit laid out on a leaf. Authentication enough for me that fairies exist, I emailed you, who reminded me Blake saw God when he was four. God got down on her omna aching knees now and then to spy on William Blake and could hardly contain her infinite self, waiting for the artist to become heaven and those paintings to be flashed to the good and bad alike as proof of the great mystery of vision even she can't figure out. Okay, change the pace. In my brain tonight, all the kids are partying in my brain tonight. Mom, everyone's having fun in my brain tonight. Me too, I'm getting loaded in my brain tonight. All relaxed and marinating in my brain tonight. Not attached to any promise of my brain tonight. No pleasure prissies in my brain tonight. Hella mamas, hella tunes in my brain tonight. Geneva Convention Conventioneers wild conventioneering in my brain tonight. And sure, tomorrow creeps in, but nothing in my brain tonight is petty. Not in this brain, not on this night. It was a lockdown poem. Sorry, so sorry. Cause I'm gonna read one that's not there, but you'll manage. Um, Shock White, thank you for bearing up. Shock White, one. After my mother died from Jesus, 
I left my hair color alone. If it's just fucking you want or all you can handle, a decent cut will do. Two. We laughed, me and her, when she stopped. It was the same faded blonde she'd been covering. Three. Once I quit, my hair prospered gray and white and where you rub my nape, auburn, like my locks from California sun, baked them red. When I was waiting to be something or someone and still didn't realize the woman who was my mother read only that bit of her job description on good shoes and teaching four daughters how to assemble do-it-yourself installations of shame. In the year of COVID fear, all the hairs on my head turned shock white, all white, only white. Back when mom was killing herself in the name of Jesus, my next oldest sister jumped shock white. She did that over and over pleading thing too. Stop, stop, stop. No changing mom is what I knew. The one time I floated my theory on the limitations of Jesus, who I like outside of church, mom kept dying. Volition and a misreading of human possibility are the careless and evil winning. And I guess one more, is that okay? Sure, Sarah, if you wanna do one more, that'd be great. Yeah, I, I don't have a time sense. Right up. The past is over, and that happens more than you think, which could be speculation like they didn't fire him because they don't know we know or don't care we know, or academic freedom is a privilege, but not like we thought. Memory is unreliable, making misdirection the sticker price of retrospection the value of the past being how it orients instinct. Hey, holiness went that way? Your coworkers raided the dispensary. The shrink wrote you a script for Valium. The pain center was a tumor crazy for your right ovary. Read the sign and calculate a likelihood. Lovable odds, you'll self-spiritualize. The cerebellum zone passed on by your father helms navigationally precise insight, codifying you and him as a teensy admirable and weensily intimidating. Look to your future. It's malleable, not like ducklings, more like wet clay shivering in anticipation of thumbs. Unreliable memory is understudy for sublimity. Observation and waiting a daily workout, zero on the thing, zero in on the thing bright eyed and hopping with more. That was Sarah Sarai, everybody. And thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing that work. Um, I've dropped the bio in the chat for folks, so please support Sarah's work, check her out um, in all these places where you can see her poetry. Um, next, moving right along, but do stay tuned for a QA and a uh, so we can ask both these poets some questions, but next I'd like to introduce everyone to Milica Mijatovic. Milica is a Serbian poet and translator born in Brečko, Bosnia. She relocated to the United States where she earned a BA in creative writing and English literature from Capital University. She received her MFA in creative writing from Boston University and is a recipient of a Robert Pinsky Global Fellowship in Poetry. Her poetry appears or is forthcoming in Rattle, the Louisville Review, Poet Lore, Collateral, Santa Clara Review, Barely South Review, and elsewhere. Her poems have been nominated for the Pushcart Prize, and she serves as assistant poetry editor for Consequence. Without further ado, Milizia, if you want to take it away. Thanks so much, SJ. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, this is such a great opportunity. And Sarah, thanks for your lovely words. That was great. Thanks so much. Um, okay, we're just gonna just gonna jump right in. I'm gonna read um, some poems from my very first chapbook called Warfoot. Um, 
this this book is takes place most of the poems take place in um my home where i'm from Pentacle. um and the first poem that i'm going to read is the first poem of the chapbook um to sort of set the scene it was the last poem that i wrote um and definitely one of the most difficult that i've written in in, in my life um and i think that's all I'll, all i'll say about this one okay ex yugoslav war 1991 to 1995. Sometimes I wish I was there during the war. I'd be me, but I wouldn't be my parents' daughter. I'd be their friend, part of their in-crowd, laughing when they laugh, ducking for cover when they duck. Sometimes I wish it so badly I forget I'm in America, find myself seeing body parts on the ground, watch as Costa gathers them in his hands. I realize he's tending to fallen apples and I stifle my scream. Later, when he offers me the fruit, I don't eat it. In my dreams, I'm more vividly dodging death by war. It's not that I want to die. It's guilt, guilt for not being there, guilt for writing of it, guilt for fleeing. I keep scouring history books, poems, cemeteries, photos, voices, villages, wrinkles, graffitied walls, bridges. I keep looking for whom I'm to be ducking from. In my imagination, I carry no weapons. I see no enemies. Who is bombing us? Who are we fighting? How many of us have died wondering? I wish I could have been there to lift a wounded soldier's head, asked, and listened. Maybe he'd know. The problem with three-sided wars is the assumption that two sides must be wrong. The problem with war is the need for one side to win. Sometimes I wish I was there when they tallied the dead and did or did not fumble to declare a victor. Who is it that won? The silence that follows creates a vacuum for anyone to howl into. I guess the loudest wins. In any case, this war follows me like a street dog hungry and alone, leaves me wondering where the bones and landmines are buried. Um, this next poem is for my grandpa. Um, he passed away when my mom was five years old, so she barely knew him, and I definitely didn't know him, um, but I've just always been connected. I always, I always make it a point to go whenever I'm home to go to his, to the grave, um, to see him and talk to him and I dream about him. And yeah, I've just always really felt connected to, um, to Denisava. So this poem is for him. Residue. In a dream, Denisava tells me he misses me, but we've never met, not in this life, not even almost. In the morning, I run to his tombstone, candles in hand, climb uneven ground, weave through the dead people, find him sitting there with family, weeds all around. Plopping beside him, I tell him I've missed him too, catch him up on my life, although he knows everything already. Dada looks at me as he always looks at me, except he has never looked at me, but we look nonetheless. I tell him about grandma, how she's still living, how she's still alone. He knows that too, because he's still dead, still alone. I tell him people keep dying and there's almost no one left in the cell. The earth keeps eating his house, a little piece there, one here, and I'm scared of the day it's just gone. I light the candles and we sit in silence as they burn. After a few minutes, I thank him for listening Tell him I'm so happy he didn't forget me. Promise I'll be back as soon as I can. I have skipped down the hill, across the field, through the village, to my car. Pavle waves to me from his vinograd as I drive away, windows down, fingers sticky from the wax. Uh, this next poem is um, the story of uh, Mama 
giving birth to me in Butchko. Um, and uh, the poem is titled Oi Golube Moi Golube, which is actually um, the title of a Serbian folk song that's really beautiful. If you haven't heard it, look it up on YouTube, it's great. Um, but the word Golub in Serbian means both dove and pigeon. In this case, we're talking about pigeons. And I think Sarah, you opened up with a, with a pigeon poem. So it's fitting. <laughs> um, okay, here it goes. Oi Golube Moi Golube. I was born to pigeons cooing. Was the war over then? Not sure. Officially, maybe yes, but mama gave birth in a windowless hospital. And by windowless, I mean the windows had been shattered by bullets or shrapnel. So the draft almost killed all of us. The pregnancy ward was one room, beds like soldiers on the front line, babies like bullets aimed at the next 100 years. I asked mama if she thought she was going to die. She said the pigeons were everywhere and everything smelled bad. I asked if anyone died. She said, not everyone noticed this big pigeon in the corner, gray and blue, mora da maica, poised and happy, warm. Sometimes I think I hear cooing, a sort of calling home. It's as if the pigeons remember mama holding me till a nurse took me because mama was coughing, sick. Both of us lived. It had to have been the pigeons. They were our peace treaties, our ceasefires. One time a man told me, every pigeon you see is a prayer. Svaki golub, ya molitva. And it made me wonder if mama ever saw any pigeons at all. Ah, okay, this next poem, um, it's called Phantom Scar Syndrome. And uh, I think I was, I don't know, I think I was in high school when I learned about um, phantom limb syndrome and, and what that is. Uh, and I think I just, I just started thinking and a few years after this, this poem appeared. Um, so here it is, Phantom Scar Syndrome. I can't find my scars. The ones that happened before my birth. The one on mama's left eyebrow, on tata's stomach, above his left ear, down his right leg. Sometimes I wince, touch those places on my skin where nothing is. I don't even know their stories, how long they bled, who helped them home, how they felt. My brain is relentless in the way its figments whisper and make me believe I was there. Is this possible, these phantom scars? Are there bullet fragments in me? We've landed in America after everything. I have scars of my own. Like the one time I said I fell onto a broken Heineken bottle in the middle of some club and cut up my right arm. I hid the cuts from my parents for weeks, even bought some scar racing cream online. Tata found out investigated my arm and answers, told me they looked like war scars. I told him they weren't, not even close. Months later, I'd catch him rubbing his right arm, wincing, as if something were there but missing, unknown, lost. Um, okay, this next poem, uh, I think is one of my favorites that I've written um partially because I wrote it seriously in like seven minutes um and it just sort of happened and then when I read it um specifically to my dad uh he just just got very emotional and he was like how how did you how do you know this you weren't even there I never told you about this etc um I'm gonna read this poem in English and in Serbian if that's that's okay um I very much wrote it in in both languages at the same time so I think that's important um, I'll read the English first. By the Burka River. When you walk by the market and when you notice that smell of fresh bananas mixed with homegrown tomatoes and newly picked oranges, think of me and how we used to walk that way together to at least a little cover the rank smell coming from the river, to forget just for a while about the battlefield waiting for us across the bridge to just for a moment inhale the air of this earth and feel how the juice from the orange wets our hands as we press our fingers 
into the skin. Pored rijeke Brke. Kada prođeš kraj pijace i kada osjetiš onaj miris svježih banana pomješan sa mirisom domaćeg paradajza i tek ubranih naranđi, pomisli na mene. I kako smo zajedno prolazili tim putem da umanjimo makar malo zadah koji dolazi iz rijeke. Da zaboravimo samo nakratko na ratište koje nas čeka preko mosta. Da udahnemo bar na tren, vazduh ove zemlje i osjetimo kako nam suh iz naranđe kvasi ruke dok je gulimo. Okay, this next poem, um, I started it on a, on a bench uh, next, to, next to the river, um, Sava, which runs through Butchko, which is where I'm from. Um, and uh, I was watching this, this man on a few, river, or a few benches down, um, just sit and, and look and uh, drink a little bit. And I, I think I just, this poem just happened. So here's Roots. Roots. Plums save people from their loneliness. So we plant plum trees across the whole country and pray for a time plums don't have to worry about us. I watch a young war veteran drink from his paper bag two benches to my left. Bodies and bombs hide in the green sava while plums shake. He remembers everything when he closes his eyes because plums don't save. But they never leave him. They're there, they whisper. You won't explode alone. Um, okay, this, this next poem, I'm not really gonna say much about this one. Um, I'll just let this one be what it is. Aftermath. Love, did you know not one day is birthless? Proves days don't exist as objects we can pocket and savor later. The sun has been stuck in your throat. No one has knocked on our sky in months. Do we not matter anymore? Last night I threw a rock at a dog and nothing. Maybe we're both ghosts. Wonder how many friends he lost, how many of my friends he carried in his mouth. I walked over to him and he bolted. What have we done? I used to sleep on a radiator, hate having time to dream. War sleep is the best sleep until you almost kill your father. What I'm trying to say is I'm alive. And if I wish for anything, it's for you to be alive too. If I ever pocket a day, I'll save it for you. Um, okay, I think those are, those are the poems I'm gonna read from my chapbook, War Food. Uh, the next two, I have two more. Um, this next one is called Flight Dream. And uh, there's a really great Serbian poet by the name of Norica Tadic. And um, I absolutely took this from him. Um, he, uh, he, ha he had these a bunch of dream poems and he would title them with the object of the dream. So let's say he dreamt about the sun. Um, his poem would be called Sun, Comma, Dream. Um, and so I have, have a lot of bizarre dreams, so I write some poems about them, and, and here's one. Flight, dream. There are so many apples on the ground. I am an apple, no a bee, no the bee's stinger stinging my body. Why are there so many apples on our side of the fence? Why can't we just have the tree? Is that what Eve wanted? Maybe Adam did too. Tata wants the apples gone so he can mow. Ivana and I carry baskets. Suddenly, I am the handle on Ivana's basket. She sets me down. I watch as both of us throw some of the fallen back to our neighbor's yard, back to where these apples belong. Will someone ever throw us back where we belong? I am an apple midair coming home. And the last poem that I'll read uh, is called Monday. And I think that's great because tomorrow's Monday and here's some magic for your, <laughs> for your Mondays. Um, all right, let's read. Monday, 
Wear your moon dress tonight. The one that makes people believe in women on the moon of the moon. We'll go skiing without our poles, glide right into the ocean, laugh all the way down. Poseidon will greet us with wine and stories and you'll ask him to take us to Atlantis, but he'll tell you, moon girl, you don't belong in the city. And you'll tell him he's not a very good host. So we'll leave, climb a ladder all the way up our favorite tree and I'll count how many times you say the word rise before you rest your head on a branch and ask me if I think our tree can feel your skin the way you can feel its bark. I'll take your hand, draw a balloon in your palm, kiss you goodnight, and watch you float away, moon dancing as you go. Thank you so much. Gorgeous. Thank you so, so much for sharing that work. Um, beautiful poems and ending with the dreamy ones. That was lovely. Um, this has just been such a treat to hear from both of you. And I do want to open up the QA. Um, like I said, at the top of the hour, if folks want to use the chat to ask questions, please feel free. But you also can unmute yourselves and ask as well. Um, so either option is available and we hope you take it. Um, but to kick us off, I often like to ask um, our poets what is inspiring them lately, and I'm extra curious, uh, Sarah, Milica, what is inspiring you these days? What is it that sparks poems for you? Um, and also maybe bonus part two question is, do you find that changing or do you think it's sort of a reoccurring, the reoccurring things that kind of get you uh, wanting to write poetry? Well. I, I don't, I think it's reoccurring. I don't think things get me to write poetry. I think it's emotions. And while there are a plentitude of emotions, you know, I kind of draw on the basic ones. So um, I had a real hard time at the beginning of the year and had time to do a lot of uh, deconstructing and then reconstructing. And I have reconstructed, so that's good. But so right now it's just, kind of I didn't read these poems but kind of discovering who I am and putting that into a poem and that's been really lovely for me and it will or won't get well I don't, it will or won't get published who knows but um so does that help otherwise I might just you know like I had read um a uh, history about the siege of Stalingrad. Actually, it was an adolescent or juvenile uh, book, but uh, but it was good. It was great, actually. And so I got really. I'm always interested in. Uh, everyone's always interested in Russia. Anyway, so that's why I wrote the um, poem about the siege of Stalingrad. I I think I identify with Stalin because he was from Georgia and my father was from Georgia. Very intense. For me, um, music, music is a big thing uh, that that inspires me. Um, I mean, just the other day, uh, there was I went I went down to Columbus, Ohio, for a few for a few days, and um, there was in the hotel there was a, a man playing the piano, and I just like. I heard it and I I went down to the lobby and I just sat there for a while and I wrote a poem. Um, yeah, I I mean sometimes it doesn't it doesn't always happen, uh, but it's it's nice when it does. I think music is a, a huge source of inspiration for me. Um, and then I, I think I agree, I agree with Sarah that um emotions, emotions inspire a lot. Except I can't when I'm in emotions of really high highs like really all of the happiness and joy in the world or really really low lows all so much sadness and heartbreak and grief I can't write in those moments I absolutely can't um and so when those moments pass I find myself um writing I don't know if it's to process or 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 what but uh music and uh and emotions <laughs> isn't that what Wordsworth said emotion reflect, recollected, or reflected in, in uh, oh, I just lost it. Reflected in tranquility? In tranquility, thank you, yeah. 
my brain. I don't know how I know that, but I, it's like, it's, wait, it's, it's, coming it's like the bumper sticker for poets. <laughs> right. So, so that's what you were describing. Thank you both for, for sharing that. Um, and does anyone in our Zoom room right now have any questions? I have one kind of right off the bat. Um, yeah. I was so happy when you two signed up together uh, to do this because uh, something that was so immediately apparent about both of your work is how pluralistic it is in the different avenues of form that you go about. Um, some people in their style and in their craft get really narrative or really dialogue heavy. Um, and every single poem that y'all submitted, that y'all read, um, just oozes so much different, uh, <laughs> wonderful craft. And I was curious, now that we know where your inspiration comes from a lot of the time, the when does the poem begin for you? Um, with all of the, let's see, nature uh, metaphors that are coming around, all of the personal history, the uh, general history that both of your work explores, um, the shifts between dialogue, in some cases, uh, the shift of language. When do you find yourself on that, like that first burst of poem, so to speak? Um, or like, where do you start originally? Does that make sense? Have I, have, did I... Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, I guess what you ask me when I'm thinking about this question, I think to, to language um, and I have, I have two, thankfully, um, luckily. Uh, and it changes for me, I think. Um, some of the poems that I read, you know, about being back home, uh, the one, the one actually, Oi Golube, Moi Golube. Um, so it would, it's titled right after a song. Um, but that poem actually started, uh, remember, if you remember at the end of the poem, um, I talk about a man who told me that every, every pigeon you see is a prayer. Um, and that's where, that's where that poem began for me. Um, and then I somehow find, found myself at the same time listening to this song called Oi Golube, Moi Golube um, in Serbian and it, it just kind of sort of came together. So I think, I guess to answer your question, um, it can be little bits of dialogue or a piece of a song um, or something I saw, something I encountered, um, just the tiniest, briefest moment, right? And then and then you, that's, it's, it's in your head. Even if you write the poem years later, it's in your head. That's kind of what happened with Phantom Scar Syndrome. Um, I was fascinated by this phantom limb syndrome, like how that could happen with that man. Thought about it a lot and did some reading about it and stuff. And then years later, I found myself writing about it. Um, so I think I think a poem can begin really anywhere. And for me, um, a lot a lot of times, I think it begin, begins in language and in little moments like that, um, that sometimes take a really long time to develop. So I'm up. Um, uh, I would say some uh, uh, just inspiration. I mean, something will come to me. Uh, I'll think, oh, I want to write about that, or else I'll just think of a poemy or clever or first line, and that'll get me started. Um, so it's it's a kind of an I don't a inspiration rather than I mean I wish that I could write there are poets who write tons about their history and and I just don't seem to have that and people like stories people like even when I write fiction I can't write a story um, I'm writing about a horse but um, but there was the poem Shock White which is about my mother who kind of destroyed herself with. Uh, religion. I had wanted to write about her for so long and about that. And um, it was just too hard. It, you know, it, it wasn't going to happen. So when I, I can't even remember when it began to manifest, 
but what was that like 50 years of, of waiting? Um, so, so I don't know. I just, I'm very open. I'm very, uh, I'm pretty unbalanced or I'm imbalanced. I forget. Um, so whatever comes to me, comes to me. And I don't, I don't really know formal poetry and I have never, I have taken anyway, I, I, I don't have formal training in poetry, but I, I've taken workshops here and there, but like, that's not what my degree is in kind of thing. So, um, but I read an awful, I didn't start writing poetry until I was in my forties. And I read, unlike most Americans, I read a lot of poetry until then. So, um, and the nice thing is that I was completely uninfluenced by uh, who was reading, you know, at Poets House, so I was on the West Coast, but, you know, I didn't know any of the contemporary poets that, yeah. So, um, you know, I knew Californians, whatever. So that's kind of it. So I have a varied background. I talk too much going. I think it's really fascinating to hear how people come into poetry. So I appreciate hearing that. Um, I still feel like I haven't started writing poetry, even though I have poems. I still feel like I haven't really started writing. <laughs> so it's nice to hear how people relate to their work. Um, but thank you guys both for that. Um, and maybe just sort of an extension of this, like where does the poem begin? kind of a craft question. You guys are talking about temporality, that sometimes these things are brewing for a while before they come onto the page. So when you're, when you are writing, are, are you also a fast, do you guys consider yourselves fast writers, slow writers? Does it change every time? Do you have a sort of process that you put every poem through or is every poem different? You want me to go for okay i'll i'll take it first because um every poem is different i don't have a process i it takes me a long time to write most of my poems simply because you know i just keep going over and over and over to make sure the word choice is right when i did start writing poetry i spent a lot of time um with with line breaks and uh can't remember her name but anyway, I read some essays about line breaks. So, and I still am very aware of those and really freaked because I'm, you know, I, I need an, uh, a brush up. But so, okay, that more or less answers a question. Yeah. As for me, um, I'd say every poem is different. Um, though I do one thing with all of my poems. Um, and that's, I, I read them out loud. Um, Robert Pinsky, uh, one of my, <laughs> one of my professors, he really like embodies uh, that's his belief, that sentence that he says that poetry is a vocal art. Um, and it so is, it absolutely is. And so whenever I write a poem, I absolutely read it out loud and see what it sounds like, like feel it. Um, and then I think, I think that's pretty much it. I think also whenever I write a poem, there are lines that I know, oh, I'll probably come back to that. It's not my favorite, or I didn't really say what I wanted to say there or whatever. And that process of editing a poem um, can sometimes, I mean, that can take me a very long time. It depends on oh, whether I wanna come back to the poem at all. Um, sometimes, sometimes it's surprising. And I think, I think just poetry, happens when it needs to happen. And I do think it's a thing you need to practice and I'm writing most of the time, something, um, even though it's, even though it might not be poetry. Um, but yeah, I think it's different every time though I do believe that it's a vocal art. And so that's something that's really important to me, how it sounds, um, how it feels. Uh, and then that will, that sort of drives the editing process and kind of finishing it, I guess. That's 
Interesting that you mentioned that because I was struck by how both of you read your poetry so well. Um, the sounds of your poems sound so full. I don't know. I don't have a good language for this, but you're both excellent readers of your work. Um, and I was lucky enough to get assigned Robert Pinsky's book, The Sound of Poetry, many years ago. And it made a huge impression on me because um, I had always thought, I think up until that time, that poetry was was about the written word. I saw it as like, oh, it's the words on the page and the words should be should good should be good words. Um, but you know, that whole book is an argument for it is not complete until it is spoken by whoever's reading it. That is the poem. And um yeah, that's interesting that that is like now part of your practice as well. Sarah, your all your poems sound like they have been spoken as well. I don't know if uh, that's also something you're thinking about is the the performance or the reading of them, um, or if that is maybe secondary for you, um, but they sound like lived in, in a way. And um, yeah, I, I like that quality about them so much. I don't think about the performance, uh, but I do think a lot about how it sounds in my head. You know, there's a lot of music in there. So I think it all works together. Great. If we have any other questions, this would be the time, folks, to jump in if you have them. Otherwise, I do want to remind um, everyone here that we have our next Poets in Pajamas reading in September. Um, and we will be back on, let's see if I have the actual date, September 9th uh, from 7 to 8 um, in this same Zoom channel. So if uh, anyone would like to join us again, we will be here um, and it will be with poets. Uh, let's see, where did my notes go? Well, the most important thing is the date, and then you can follow us on uh, Poets in Pajamas, the Facebook page, as well as our um, WordPress site uh, for any updates and bios of our readers. Um, but this has just been such a pleasure to hear you both um, and how beautiful your work is and engaging and thought-provoking and fresh it is um, in your perspectives and in your approaches. So this has just been a real treat and I wanna thank you for joining us and for everyone tuning in as well. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone. Yeah. Thank you, have a good night. Thanks. Okay. <laughs>